Kings. First Kings chapter 8. Let's get into the word. Oh, Father, you're so good. You're so gracious to us. And we ask that you would speak to us through your word tonight, that we may grow in you and understand the things that you have called us to understand. If there's anything in our hearts right now, Lord, that is just causing us not to hear from you, we ask that you would remove it by your blood and that you fill us by your spirit. And you would just fall more in love with you right now. In Jesus' name, amen. So, 1 Kings, Solomon has finished his temple. He's built it. He's prepared it. He set it all up, moved the stuff in. Furniture is done. It's time to do service. A building project that took seven years, and now it's time to enjoy it. And he's going to dedicate it to God in 1 Kings 8, which is also the longest chapter in Kings. And so he lays it out. In verse 1, he says, Now Solomon assembled the elders of Israel uh, and all the heads of the tribes and the chief fathers of the children of Israel to King Solomon in Jerusalem, that they might bring up the Ark of the Covenant to the Lord from the city of David, which is in Zion. Uh, so it's a, quite the leadership. Everybody who's somebody is in heads of the tribes, the elders, the chief fathers. And the purpose was to move the Ark from the south, which is the city of David, to the north, towards that new building complex on the fleshing floor of Ornan. And so he's bringing it up. And in verse 2, it says, Therefore all the men of Israel assembled with King Solomon at the feast in the month of Eph Ethanim, which is in the seventh month. Now this is, of course, is the Feast of Tabernacles. It is a special feast also known as Sukkoth. And so it's a uh, Feast of Tabernacles, usually in September and October time. And uh, so it's estimated because the command to come in and pilgrim up to Jerusalem it's around, we believe, estimated around 1 million people in Jerusalem at this time. It's a lot of people. And it was a special feast day because they're doing a dedication unto the Lord for this temple. And in verse 3, it says, So all the elders of Israel came, and the priests took up the ark. Then they brought up the ark of the Lord, the tabernacle of meeting, and all the holy furnishings that were in the tabernacle. The priests and the Levites brought them up. So we know that... <clears throat> David brought the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem back in 2 Samuel. He danced before the Ark. It was a great day. But when he did that, he, he, he pitched a tent in Jerusalem. And that was called the Tent of David. The head tabernacle, of course, we know is in Gibeah. And that had the, the, the furnishings, the, the menorah, the showbread table, the altar of incense, the brazen altar. That was all in Gibeah. Now, with the tabernacle, the tent proper. But sometime between then, actually, uh, since the, in that seven-year period, they brought the tabernacle part back to Jerusalem, and it was there in the city of David. And they're bringing up, really, the old furniture, <laughs> the old brazen altar, the old uh, br br brass laver, the, the tent, everything. Uh, they are going to be stored there in the temple. They're not going to be used. He built all new. It's all the new altar, a new menorah. Actually, he's got 10 menorahs now, 10 uh, showbread tables, a new all golden uh, uh, altar of incense. Uh, the only one that's going in, we know for sure, is the Ark of the Covenant is going to this new place. And in verse 5, and also King Solomon, all the congregation of Israel who were assembled with him, were with him before the ark, sacrificing sheep and oxen that could not be counted or numbered for multitude. Now, back in 2 Samuel, David did this before the ark. It says that he would, would walk six steps and make sacrifice unto the Lord. Walk another six steps, make sacrifice to the Lord. That's a lot of blood and guts. So it's just like, you just imagine on this road, if you own a little bread shop outside, you know, you're like, my goodness, what are you doing? Slaughtering an animal right in front of my bread shop. It was probably a little, it was messy. But yet it was a thing of honoring and offering up worship to God, wanting atonement for sin, worshiping God. And so they would sacrifice, and David danced before the Lord. But now Solomon is doing the same thing, and he says 
There's so many sacrifices going on, we don't even number, know the number of sacrifices. There are so many. So Solomon, again, is outdoing his father, not, not wanting to be better, just he, he's a, Solomon's more. He's just more. Have you ever know, known people that are just do more? They just go the extra, extra mile, the extra, you know, the extra oomph. Kelly does this. Kelly's such a great entertainer, and she just, when she does things, she goes the extra mile to go places. My, my dad was like that, too. He, remember, Kelly, he, was just, uh, he would just do that. Uh, just, he, if he had a church event, he wouldn't just have ice cream. Remember, Ben? It was everything. It was, oh, we got, or the men's breakfasts. James, remember those? It wasn't just eggs and bacon. It was cereal, granola, three types of cereal. Don't forget, you know, some people might want the milk. And, and the milk might, you know, we'll get whole because that just tastes good. But we'll get non-fat, maybe a 1% and maybe an almond milk. And, and that's how he was. And it drove me crazy because I'm the dude who has to put it together. I was a second, so I'm like, we don't need all this. And, you, and, and, you, and there, now the, the, the leadership in the church now talk me down because I have that DNA in me. You know, he's like, I just hear my dad saying, oh, you, you know what? You need more. And I'm like, oh. You know, and so here he is, just more sacrifices. Why? Not to show off, just to glorify God. Glorify God. So therefore, when you guys in leadership come up to me and say, we don't need granola at the men's breakfast, say, hey, why would you want to stiffen or put down what God's doing through the granola? No, I'm just joking. But guys, this is how it is. It's just more, just more. And in verse 6, then the priest brought in the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to its place into the inner sanctuary of the temple. Now remember, that's called the Holy of Holies to the most holy place under the wings of the cherubim. Remember, in the, in the temple, there were these humongous, massive cherubim wings. Kathy, if you got that picture, throw it up when you have a chance. No problem if you don't have it. But these wings above the, this, this uh, area, there it is, of overlapping, surrounding from wall to wall and touching the middle, this beautiful golden room. And so he, he, they bring it in. In verse 6, verse 7, For the cherubim spread their two wings over the place of the ark, and the cherubim overshadowed the ark and its poles. Like the poles, oh you know, yeah, there's poles to this thing, remember. The poles extended. Now remember, oh, hold on. The Ark of the Covenant, you can see it right there. The, you, we have in our brains Steven Spielberg's representation of the Ark of the Covenant. We all are there. It's all there. We're not sure the exact replica. We know what the Bible says. That's exact. We know that the poles that were used to carry were not at the top, but they were at the bottom. And so they were at the bottom of the feet, the Bible says. So you see the poles are at the top of the lid. They're really at the bottom. So it was all box on top, and the poles are on the bottom. And there were little, these little loops that was in the box. The Ark of the Covenant was made of three pieces. You had the solid gold lid called the mercy seat. That was all one piece, solid gold, with cherubim on top, and the mercy seat was in the middle where the presence of God dwelt, right there. You had the box, the ark part. That was acacia wood, layered in gold, inside and the outside. And then you had the third part, which were these poles. The Bible says in Exodus that once these poles were slid in, they shall not be removed. We do not know the, the size of these poles or how long they were, but we know that in the, in the tabernacle, the size of the Holy of Holies was 15 feet by 15 feet, 10 cubits by 10 cubits. This is 20 cubits by 20 cubits. It's Solomon style, just double it. Just double the sucker. And so these poles are there. We know that they're there, but there's something very interesting that happens with the poles. Verse 8, the poles extended so that the ends of the poles could be seen from the holy place. That means the, the holy place is 
the room in front of the Holy of Holies. You can see the poles extend out from the holy, uh, uh, could be seen from the holy place in the front of the inner sanctuary, but they could not be seen from the outside, and they are there to this day. So whoever's writing this, the temple is still there. It's before the destruction of the temple, and you can still see it. They left it, and it, that's the way it was. So what did they mean? What were they sticking out through the curtain? Scholars believe that they were bulging out to the curtain, that when they sat it down, See the poles go side to side here? It was really, the poles were this way. If you want to get accurate with the ark, the poles do not go long ways. They go this way. So when you would carry the ark, the cherubims would move this way. You see it, guys? And so they were on this side of the ark. So Spielberg, even though it's a great picture, and we all think of it that way, he goes, it's the other way, all right? So it was almost like a throne. That's why it was called a mercy seat. And it was these cherubim on top. And the poles extended or bulged. The, there's a curtain there on the accordion doors. There's a curtain that hung there. And it bulged out so you knew the ark was in there. And it was there. Now, you're like, where's the Ark of the Covenant? We don't know. It's, uh, some people think it's like in the movie, it's in Egypt. Uh, because Egypt came through and pillaged the temple uh, before the destruction of the, of the Babylonians. Some people think it was carried away to the descendants of Solomon and the Queen of Sheba, which are the Ethiopian Jews, which it could be. Uh, that's a stretch, and they say they have it. They have some very interesting artifacts that kind of lean that way. But then there are rabbinical sources that were very close during the time of the Babylonian destruction. That people talk about a lot that Jeremiah, the prophet, hid it underneath the Temple Mount. That there are uh, quarries and uh, blocked off areas. And they went digging one time and one rabbi says, I found it. But he won't tell us where he found it at. Uh, actually, well, they know where it is, but it's underneath that big golden dome. Uh, and so the, it, it could kill somebody uh, because, not the ark, it won't happen like that. But uh, the Arabs get mad when you dig underneath their property. Um, so with that said, there is, uh, we, can it be found? It could be. We know when it will be found, though. The Bible says that in the last days, in the new heaven, the new earth, and the new temple, uh, during the, there, the ark will be there. Uh, so it, we're like, where is it at? Well, we know that at the end of time, God has the ark. Uh, so it, he'll find it. He knows where it's at, and it's still in play. And you're like, what? Is it going to be a new one? It says the Ark of the Covenant will be in the heavenly scene in the kingdom age during that time, which I think is fascinating. Uh, will they find it beforehand? I'm not sure. It was hidden during the time of Jesus. Uh, when they would go and do Yom Kippur during the time of Jesus, the presence of God was not there in that temple. It had been taken out. We'll, we'll get to the, when we talk about the destruction of the temple, God's presence was taken out of Solomon's temple before its destruction and did not return until Jesus went into the house of the Lord to cleanse it out. Or when he was a kid. That, that's when the presence of God finally came back in, in the person of Jesus Christ. Isn't that crazy? And so well, well, that's a whole other Bible study. I totally rabbit trailed, but that is some good stuff. And so with that said, the Ark of the Covenant's there, and the poles are sticking out uh, to show that it's there. And you're like, well, why does it have to poke out? Why, what, what's the deal? Why? Some people think the next verses will tell us why. In verse 9, it says, nothing was, no, first of all, back to the Ark. Uh, there was one more verse about the Ark. Nothing was in the Ark except the two tablets of stone which Moses put there at Horeb when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. Now we know from the scriptures that there was more than just the Ten Commandments in that box. There was also a jar of manna. When manna fell from heaven, they scooped up a jar, they kept it, and they put it in the ark, and it stayed pure. It was a testimony of that wonderful sign and wonder of God's miraculous feeding of the people. So there was a jar of manna in the, in the, in the Ark of the Covenant for a while. And also, remember when the sons of Korah and all those guys tried to become the priests and usurp the authority of Moses and Aaron? 
It says that God says, okay, everybody, all the tribes, line up your, all the, the leaders of the tribes, line up your, your rod before the, the door of the tabernacle. And whichever rod blossoms and buds, that's the one. That's the guy that I've chosen. And when they put it out there, Aaron's rod blossomed and budded almond blossoms. And so they took that, and all the people who were in the rebellion were consumed by fire right there. It was a really big barbecue. And just, just took them out. That's, that's how you handle a church split right there. Boom! You know, just like, boom! God just took them out. And so he took the, the, and they took that rod that budded and blossomed, and they put it inside the ark. And it was there. Here, they're not there. Just the Ten Commandments. What happened to them? We don't know. Some people think that the Philistines might have taken them when it was captured in, in 1 Samuel. Some people think that the people of Beth Shemesh took them out when they opened the ark. Uh, maybe God did it. Maybe God just said, ah, well, let's get them out. Um, or maybe God commanded them to take it out. We don't know. We don't know what happened to those two emblems that were in the ark. But there, there's this spiritual lesson here. Here's God's word, the basis of the God's word, Ten Commandments, right? The law, which is, is the practicality of loving God and loving others. It's all about love, the Ten Commandments. And here, those things, the signs and the wonders, they don't last. Signs and wonders are great things. Jesus says that signs and wonders follow after faith. That, and it's a neat thing. It's, it comes after faith. Faith doesn't come by signs, signs and wonders, Jesus says. He says, you ask for a sign, you know what? Hey, you, even if you get a sign, even if I do provide a sign, it's not going to convince you. Signs and wonders are a result of faith. They follow faith. They're a result of God's hand. But the signs and wonders don't last. They just disappear. But what remains? God's word. God's word always remains. There are people in our world, in a Christian society, that just, it's all about signs and wonders. And they get obsessed with signs and wonders. And it's, a, it's not healthy. Does God still do miracles? Absolutely. Does God still do signs? Oh, yeah. Does he still do miracles and healings? Absolutely. We've seen this. It's very evident. There's nothing wrong with that. But if we say that we need signs and wonders as the basis of our faith, that's not our faith. Our faith is the Word. And the Word of God lasts. Jesus says, you guys are here for a sign. That's all you care about. And he rebuked them for it. And then also, the children of Israel, out of all the people, saw the signs the most. They saw a pillar of cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night. They walked through the water. They saw man on the ground. Quail was provided to eat. They saw the ten plagues in Egypt. And what did they do? They were, did not, they were not allowed to go into the promised land because they had no faith. Signs and wonders do not produce a faith worthy of the Lord. The word of God does, though. How crazy is that? Remember what Jesus said with the Lazarus and the... And the rich man, the rich man said, send Lazarus back from the dead to warn my brothers not to live a bad life so they won't come here. And, and what did Abraham say? He goes, hey, they have the law. They have the prophets. They have God's word. If they don't believe that, they won't believe your brother. Uh, they won't believe Lazarus back from the dead. Signs and wonders don't cut it. It is simply the word of God. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by signs and wonders? No, the Word of God. Now, I'm not dogging miracles, but I'm saying that's a lesson for us here in verse 9. Now, look at verse 10. And it came to pass when the priest came out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priest could not continue ministering because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. This is the Holy Spirit. Uh, in the Hebrew, the word is Chabad. The, um, the, the rabbis use the word the Shekinah glory of God. Uh, Exodus 33, 9, 11, and 20 talks about the presence of God like a cloud. Um, it, it's, you see this cloud 
everywhere. The glory of God. Um, Isaiah 4, 5. Uh, let me just get over there and read it to you real quick. And Isaiah 4, 5 tells us a little, uh, the duality of this kabod, the glory of God. When we think of the glory of God, we automatically just think of something bright and shiny, you know, uh, fire or something like that, something bright, something that sparkly going around, you know. Sometimes in movies we see that. Uh, but here it says in, in Isaiah 4 or 5 about the glory of God, starting in verse 4, it says, When the Lord has washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and purged the blood of Israel from her midst by the spirit of judgment and the spirit of burning, then the Lord will create above every dwelling place of Zion, Mount Zion and above her assemblies a cloud and smoke by day and a shining of flaming fire by night. For over all the glory there will be a covering. So we notice there is a covering, a cloud of fire and smoke. Above the glory of God. God covers his glory with a cloud. Exodus 33. Let's just read it real quick. It's, it's good. We've got to read it. Exodus 33, verse 9, says this. And it came to pass. So Moses makes a little, ta the first tabernacle, which is a little, a little tent that Moses made. And it said, came to pass when Moses entered the tabernacle, this little tiny thing, that the pillar of cloud descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle. And the Lord talked with Moses. And the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the tabernacle door. And all the people rose and worshipped each man, uh, worshipped each man in his tent door. So the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And he would return to the camp. But his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. He was stoked about the cloud. But the cloud showed up. Pillar of fire by night, cloud by day. The glory of God is clouded. And uh, you're like, why? So they're in there, and they're, they're, they put the ark in. They shut the curtain. There's that bulge of the poles right there coming out. You see it right there, evidence that the ark is in there. And you're like, why are those poles sticking out? Because they, when they went into that temple, it was dark. Because what showed up? God's presence. A cloud came in there. And it was so much that they couldn't do the work. They had to go outside and do everything. They had to go outside. It was too thick. It, they couldn't take it. They couldn't see. They couldn't see inside that place because the glory of God was there. Remember when Moses asked God, God, I want to see your glory. What did, you, what did God say? You can't do it. You'll melt. Did not you see the movie? No, I'm just joking. No, he said, you'll melt. He, won't, he didn't say you'll melt. He said, you just can't take it. No man has seen God and lived, God said in the scriptures. He says, but this is what I'll do. I'll do you solid. Literally, get in the rock. Solid rock. I'm going to do you solid. Get in the crack, this cleft of the rock. And I'm going to cover you up. I'm going to pass by. And when I tell you, look, you can see my afterglow. You can just see the, the shining from, the, from my back. You can just see the, the shine. That's all. And so he covers him. He covered, he, had, he was in darkness. And he says, okay, you ready? And he just saw just a, just a smidge, just a smidge. And it says that Moses' face shined. It was actually shined forth. It wasn't glow in the dark. It was psh, it was affected. His actually skin was affected by seeing just a bit of the glory of God. If Moses said, oh, if God said to Moses, all right, you know what, I'll let you see the whole thing. He would have vaporized. God wraps himself in a cloud. Why? It, it says in the scriptures that the clouds are the dust of his feet. In the scriptures. When I see clouds, I just say, oh, Lord. And does not Jesus come and he's going to meet us where? In the sky and in the clouds. Some people think, oh, those are the puffy things with condensation. I think it's his glory. It's amazing. And it's, co it, it is covered by a cloud. Why? Because we can't take the glory. But this is the cool thing. When Jesus died for our sins... And the apostles became saved. They're in that upper room. And what occurred? Did a cloud show up? No. Was it, there was a sound of wind. And then what happened? 
flaming tongues of fire, little flickering flames of fire was above each one. And it was bright. It was no cloud. See, for us, we look through a mirror dimly. But yet the Holy Spirit, remember what Jesus says? Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Paul says that Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. He's the light of the world. His light shines. And because he shines, there's no cloud. And what are we called? We're gonna, you're going to learn it this Sunday. We're, 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 we're children of the day. We're children of light, according to Ephesians. How great is that? And so the cloud, because Jesus has come, we have, we, there's no cloud. We can walk boldly into the throne room of God. We can come boldly into his holy of holies, into the presence of God the Father. And we can behold the glory of God. Why? Because of what Jesus did on the cross. And through his spirit. How great is that? And in verse 12, then Solomon spoke, the Lord said he would dwell in the dark cloud. I have surely built you an exalted house and a place for you to dwell in forever. He's, ex he's explaining it. He goes, hey, God said he would dwell, would dwell in the dark cloud. You're like, oh, that's such against my, th my thinking of what God looks like. You know, I think bright, shining, like he is, well, the God is light and in him is no darkness. But he dwells in the darkness here. Why? Because they couldn't take it. It wasn't time yet. His glory is revealed through his son at the cross, resurrected, ascended on high, blood applied, and we could see his glory because we're, we're forgiven. We're justified. But I love how he says he dwells in the dark cloud. Have you ever found yourself in the dark? <laughs> like, I don't know what's going on. God's there. Maybe you're in a dark place. God's there. Maybe you don't see God's hand, but he's there in the dark. If you are God's, the blood has been applied and you have entrance, God will show himself as light in the darkness. He's there. How great is that? We just, the Jewish people just came out of the Feast of Purim a couple days ago. In Israel here, there's the Feast of Purim, and that's the whole essence of the Feast of Purim, that you can't see God. He's masked. He's hidden. In the book of Esther, you never see the name of God mentioned one time. God, Jehovah, Lord, is never mentioned in the book. But yet you see his hand mightily being used. He's there. You might not see him, but he's there. How great is that? And so he says, hey, the Lord, <laughs> I wonder if they're all out there going, well, now what, Solomon? And Solomon just speaks up to the Lord and says, the Lord said he would dwell in the dark cloud. I have surely built you an exalted house of God. He goes, hey, this is what he said. This is what he is. And in verse 14, and the king turned around and blessed the whole assembly of Israel while all the assembly of Israel was standing. And so he's now going to bless the people. And he said, blessed be the Lord God of Israel who spoke with his... It's more of a, uh, a declaration that he's making. He's going to make a declaration. He's telling everybody this. Uh, it's a big Solomonic tweet right here, okay? And he said, blessed be the Lord God of Israel who spoke with his mouth to my father David. And with his hand has fulfilled it, saying, Since the day that I brought my people out of Egypt, I have chosen no city from any tribe of Israel in which to build a house that my name might be there. But I chose David to be over my people Israel. Notice he says, I never chose a city, but I chose a man. David. Now it was in the heart of my father David to build a temple for the name of the Lord God of Israel. But the Lord said to my father David, whereas it was in your heart, so this is God talking to David, whereas it was in your heart to build a temple for my name, you did well that it was in your hearts. I'm glad that you had a heart to build me in this house. Nevertheless, you shall not build the temple, but your son who will come from your body, he shall build the temple for my name. So that's what God told David. And David said, all right. I'll do it. So the Lord, and then this is what Solomon says. So the Lord has fulfilled his word which he spoke. And I have filled the position of my father David and sit on the throne of Israel. And as the Lord promised, and I have built a temple 
for the name of the Lord God of Israel. And there I have made a place for the ark, and which is the covenant of the Lord, which he made to our fathers, which he brought them out of the land of Egypt. So quite the declaration he makes to the people. He says, David had a heart to build the temple. And it went, that, that heart was expressed to God's ears. He heard it. God's will was different. He says, it's not going to be you, David. And he said, this is, your, this is my word. It's going to be through your son, not you, that this temple will be built. God's hand moved. Solomon took over. And then Solomon's actions happened. God did it. What Solomon is saying is, God has kept his word. He said it was going to be this way, and it has happened. He said it, and he did it, period. This is going to be a reoccurring theme to the whole, the whole process here. He's going to, he starts with God, God's will and God's faithfulness and God's promises being fulfilled, and he's going to end with it. It's like bookends. Verse 22, he begins the dedication, the prayer. Here's Solomon's dedication prayer. He's going to talk to God. Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of the assembly of Israel. He is not on the steps of the temple. He is not outside the temple. He's by the altar of the temple. And so Solomon stood before the altar of the, of the Lord in the presence of the assembly. Uh, he built, there was a platform there. There was a ramp leading up, a big platform, and a new altar there. So he, we believe that he's probably on that platform. And, he, and he spread, so he's, he's standing up, and he spread out his hands towards the heaven. And he said, now this is a position of prayer. Very fascinating. There are tons of positions of prayer in the Bible. You see people praying, laying up flat on their face. You see people laying flat on their back, praying to God. You see people on their knees. You see people with hands lifted high, head extended up, talking to God. The one position you do not see is people with their head bowed, eyes closed, and hands folded. Mm -hmm. The one we do, we don't see. You're like, well, should we not do that? Ah, it's okay. God doesn't care about your body position. He doesn't care about your heart position in prayer. But guys, I'll tell you, here it is. Therefore, you know what? You don't want to see my, the position I have when I'm praying to God the most? It's uh, 10 and 2. Uh, <laughs> praying. Praying to God while I'm driving. That, that's the California, Southern California style right there. It's like, oh, Lord. You know, with, with eyes open, mind you. My eyes open. And you pray that way. But here you have, you have some great positions. Try practicing those positions sometimes. You know, oh, Lord, hands lifted up. I can't now. I can't do hands. I, I got a torn rotator cuff on the left side. So it's like this is as far as it goes up. You know, so I'm, I'm half and half. You know, and they always talk about hand positions, you know. You, the I surrender, you know, and, uh, or the I receive, you know, and uh, there's, there, there's some, and some I, I don't, there's this one. I don't like that one. I don't like that one. Uh, but some people do that. Oh, tilt that hand up, you know, just like, oh, Lord, I give, I give you praise and honor. I'm giving that to you. Some people do the, the, the beat in the chest and the, and the, and the, and the hand. I, okay, I get that. It's very, you know, Yom Kippur-ish. You know, they used to beat their chest on Yom Kippur and say, oh, woe is me. You know, I understand that one. You know, I, I, there's a Christian comedian that has, you know, carry the TV, carry the big screen, you know, and, and he makes it light of that. But it, it's about the heart. It's about the heart, the position of the heart. He'll talk, actually talk about that in a second. So he lifts his hands, he's standing at the, at the altar, and he says, and this is a, one of the greatest prayers in the Bible, guys. It's long, <laughs> it's long. Lord God of Israel, there is no God in heaven above or on earth below like you, who keep your covenant and mercy with your servants, who walk before you with all their hearts. You have kept what you promised your servant David, my father. You have both spoken with your mouth and fulfilled it. You said it and you did it. With your hand, as it is this day. You're just faithful, God. You just do, you said it and you did it. That's why it's so important to be in the Word. When you're in the Word, guys, He says it, you hear it, and then you watch Him do it. 
If you're not in the Word, you don't know what He says. How can we? Re how do we know what God promises if we don't read His promises? And it's going to come from the Word, not anybody else. The Word. That's why we read it. <laughs> it's so important. And so as you, you kept your promise, you fulfilled it by your hand. Verse 25, Therefore, Lord God of Israel, now keep what you promised your servant David, my father, saying, you shall, not fa you shall not fail to have a man sit before me on the throne of Israel. Only if your sons take heed to their ways, that they may walk before me as you have walked before me. So he says, hey, I, I keep that one. I want to stay on this job. You know, I want to stay seated on, your, on the throne that you promised. And now I pray, O God of Israel, let your word come true. Oh, isn't that a good thing to pray when you get a verse? When you read a verse in the Bible and you go, and this is a good thing to pray. Oh, you'll never leave me for, nor forsake me. Oh, let your word come true. Oh, look at this promise here in Philippians. Oh, let your word come true. That is so, let your word come true, which you have spoken to your servant David, my father. But will God, and then he says this, here is a gigantic temple complex, golden, trillions of dollars. He says this, but will God indeed dwell on the earth? Does God really dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the heaven of the heavens cannot contain you, how much less than this temple which I have built. He's all like, what is this rinky-dink thing? Nothing can contain you. He just makes the acknowledgement, this sucker cannot hold you. You are greater than the heavens and the heavens' heavens. You know, they always talk about, I don't know the n numbers. I have a number dyslexia, I think. I, I just, ugh, you know, I just scramble with numbers. But when they talk about the vastness of the galaxy and the universes it blows your mind how vast it is and God is a beyond all that I, I, he, he's not like some God like, and, and, and he's some giant God it's just he's beyond it it's just it's just beyond I, he, he's not a massive he's a great God he, he cannot be contained I, I, I never think of him as a giant ogre god sitting on a massive ogre throne in a massive far away. He's just outside of it. His glory, his greatness, his person is just greater than everything. When you see the vastness of everything, he's, he's just, and I know he holds it in the palm of his hands, but it, it, it just he's not so great that he's far away. He's, he's, so, he's God, but yet he is close. And he looks at all the vastness of the cosmos and all that junk and swirling chaos of gas and rock and eons of time and space and matter. And he focuses on one little dinky galaxy. And in that dinky little galaxy in between two humongous arms of that galaxy that are swinging around a big, massive series of black holes that's holding it together. And then all this is swinging through the vastness of the eons of the emptiness of time, going quickly towards another one, which they say in billions of years we'll be hitting another galaxy called the Andromeda Galaxy, and then ends life on Earth everywhere. And then it's this thing swirling around. In the middle of those two arms is this little star, totally by itself. By itself. Around it are these planets swinging around. And these planets are swinging around in between these two massive arms that protect it from all the other space junk in the world. And then the, and then the third rock from that star called the sun... He's there. He puts the one thing he loves most on the whole, everything else. It, it, people. It, it, he, he said, all right, I'm going to do something here. Wow. That's the vastness of God. And he says, this place can't hold you. Solomon understood this. He was an observer of all things nature. 
he was an observer of, of the greatness of God. And he goes, this place can't contain you, nor can this world. Yet, regard the prayer of your servant and his supplication, O Lord my God, and listen to the cry and the prayer which your servant is praying before you today that your eyes may be open towards this temple night and day, toward the place of which you said, my name shall be there, that you may hear the prayer which your servant makes towards this place, and may you hear the supplication of your servant, the begging prayer of your servant, and of your people Israel, when they pray towards this place, here in heaven, your dwelling place, when you hear, forgive. Whoa. He says, out of all the vastness, the cosmos, and the vastness of this planet, this place, let this place, let this place be the place that we can just talk to you. We want this to be a meeting point of prayer. A meeting spot where we can meet with you and talk. And, and not just that, get right. That you may forgive. That you f f focus on this place. Now he is going to go into seven situations in his prayer that will be a place where... Th this is the seven reasons why the temple is going to be there. And he's going to lay it out. Verse 31, when anyone sins against his neighbor and is forced to take an oath and comes and takes an oath before your altar in this temple, then hear in heaven and act and judge and uh, your servants, condemning the wicked, bringing his ways on his head and justifying the righteous by giving him according to his righteousness. This temple, my prayer, that it's going to be a place where Enter personal problems get solved. If you've got a beef with your brother, if you've got a beef with your sister, if there's sin going on, that this is the place where you hash it out. That this is the place where problems are solved with others. That's what the temple's going to be for. Verse 33, second one. When your people Israel are defeated before an enemy because they have sinned against you, and when you turn, uh, and, and when they turn back to you and confess your name and pray and make supplication to you in this temple, then hear in heaven, hear them in heaven, and forgive the sin of your people Israel and bring them back to the land which you gave to their fathers it, as a nation, a national place. Let this place be a national place that if we lose and are defeated in sin and we are in the defeated area, this is the place we come back to. We, we, when we get defeated, this is the place where we cut back to God. This is the place. And then hear them in heaven and forgive them. Number three, when the heavens are shut up and there is no rain because they have sinned against you, when they pray towards this place and confess your name and turn from their sin because you afflict them, then hear in heaven and forgive the sin of your servants, your people Israel, that you may teach them the good way in which they should walk. Isn't that cool? It's a place of teaching. And send rain on your land, which you have given to your people as an inheritance. If the people in sin, this is what verse 35 and 36 talk about. This is, what, this is what this place is for. That when the people are in sin and there's a dry time. When there's a dry time in the, in the, in the, in the nation. When there's a time of drought. That this is the place that they can come and confess their sin. You can forgive them. And that they may be taught your word. There is the rain and the washing of God's word happens and they be taught and the drought can be over in the land. Dry times and carnality is dealt with at the, at the, at the temple. In verse 37, number four, when there is famine in the land, pestilence or blight or mildewed, locusts or grasshoppers, when their enemy besieges them in the land of their cities, wherever plague or whatever sickness there is, whatever prayer, whatever prayer, whatever supplication is made, 
by anyone or by all your people, Israel, when each one knows the plague of his own hearts, <laughs> amazing, and spreads out his hands towards the temple, then here in heaven, your dwelling place, and forgive and act and give to everyone according to all his ways, whose heart you know, for you alone know the hearts of all the sons of men, that they may fear you all the days that they live in the land which you gave to our fathers. There would be times where because of the sin of the people or the sin of a person or a community in Israel that God would send a disease or a blight, a mildew, something that would separate them. Something filthy, locusts, bugs. This is a, t a bothersome times. It just It's a gross time. He said, but th the temple is a place that we could get that removed. That mildew, that mold, the sin, the plague of the heart, that the plague of the heart can be removed and the plague of the land can be removed. This is the place. Come here. This is where you get it removed. That you may fear the Lord. The fear of the Lord is to hate all evil. Any type of compromise and sin. This is the place you get rid of it. Verse 41, here's number five. Moreover, concerning a foreigner who is not of your people Israel. Those, Solomon said the temple so that people from all over the world could come here and seek the Lord. Wow. Isn't that crazy? And, he, and so he says, and, and it was open. Moreover, concerning a foreigner who is not of your people Israel, but has come from a far country for your name's sake, for they will hear of your great name and your strong hand and your outstretched arm. When he comes and prays towards this temple, then you hear them in heaven, your dwelling place, and do according to all for which the foreigner calls to you, that all the people of the earth may know your name and fear you, as do the people of Israel, and that they may know that this temple which I have built is called by your name. The temple was a place of outreach. It was a place to bring people in that were not of the people and bring them in so that they could become people of God. It was a place of outreach. Bring them in. Verse 44. What is this temple going to be like? When, number six in verse 44. When your people go out to battle against their enemy, whether you send them, wherever you send them, and when they pray to the Lord towards the city which you have chosen and the temple which I have built for your name, then here in heaven their prayer and their supplication and maintain their cause. When they're out for war, it's supposed to be a place to look back and to pray towards. We're going to war and we're going to pray towards their temple that you give us victory. So the temple is not just a place that you go and pray. It's a place that when we're out fighting the battle, that we can look back and say, God, he did, you're not going to take the temple with you. It's too big. It's stationary. The poles are struck. It ain't going anywhere. So you pray back to that place. Back in the day, they would take the tabernacle with them to fight. Here they look, the tabernacle is there. And they go out and they pray towards this place. And God will hear in heaven. In verse 46, here's the big one. Number seven, when they sin, the people, when they sin against you for their, and how great is this? I, I wonder if Paul loved this. You see a lot of Paul in this passage. This is so Romans chapter four, five, and six. When they sin against you, for there is no one who does not sin. <laughs> for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I mean, <laughs> but he loved this passage, Paul did. For when they sin against you, for there is no one who does not sin, and you become angry with them, God, and you take your people and you deliver them to the enemy, and they take them captive to a land of the enemy far or near. Yet when they come to themselves, when they come, they, they realize, what the heck are we doing? In the land where they were carried captive, and, and they repent in that land and make supplication to you in the land of those who took them captive, saying, and they say, we have sinned. And done wrong, and we have committed wickedness. And when they return to you with all their hearts and with all their soul in the land of their enemies, who led them away captive and pray to you towards their land, whom you gave to their fathers, the city which you have chosen and the temple which you have built for your name, then here in heaven, 
your dwelling place, their prayer and their supplication and maintain their cause and forgive your people who have sinned against you and all their transgressions which you have transgressed against you, which they have transgressed against you and grant them compassion, be kind to them before those who took them captive that they may have compassion on them for they are your people and your inheritance whom you brought out of Egypt out of the iron furnace says you you took them out of one country you'll bring them back from another <laughs> that your eyes may be open to your supplication of your servants and the supplication of your people Israel to listen to them whenever they call to you for you separated them from among all the people of the earth to be your inheritance as you spoke by your servant Moses when you brought our fathers out of Egypt O Lord God what a prayer so he says he knew that they were going to sin, and he knew what the law said. The law back in Numbers and in uh, Deuteronomy, Exodus, they said, listen, if you do not obey God, guess what's going to happen? Eventually, I'm going to allow foreign enemies to come in and take you out, and they're going to take you captive. This happened with the Assyrians, and it happened with the Babylonians. Guess what? He says, when you're there in that country, you're going to have an epiphany. We need to repent. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 3, Daniel is praying almost the same prayer. Read it tonight. Daniel chapter 9, all the way to verse 11. And he is praying, God, where we've sinned, and they're repenting in hopes that, hey, we're going to go back home soon, that you're going to bring us back. And this is where we pray towards. Daniel got arrested, remember, and thrown into the Daniel in the lion's den. He got thrown into the lion's den because he was praying towards Jerusalem. When you go to Israel, the Jewish people will get up somewhere over the Mediterranean Ocean, go to the back of the plane, put on their prayer shawls, and pray towards the head of the plane because it's headed towards Israel. And they're praying towards Israel. It's fascinating. It's like, should we pray towards Israel? No, we're not Jewish. We can pray wherever. We pray, you know, hands lifted up, lifted up high. And so these seven things, that's what the temple is going to be for. And so it was when Solomon had finished praying all this prayer and supplication of the Lord that he arose from before the altar of the Lord from kneeling on his knees with his hands spread up to heaven. Notice, guys, here's Solomon praying. It says previously that he was standing. At the end of the prayer, he's on his knees. He was praying so hardcore that it buckled him. How, when was the last time you and I have prayed that way? Where you're praying and then all of a sudden we just find ourselves on the floor? Have you prayed that way before? That the heaviness of prayer? This is September and October. I wonder if he's sweating. He, he just, he just he, the, the burden of prayer, the supplication. Now, prayer is not measured by the loudness of the prayer. It's not measured by the words of the prayer. The greatness of your prayer is not measured by if you speak Old English. Oh, God, thou art the Lord. No. It is not measured by your vocabulary. It's not measured by your ex exuberance. Oh, God, hear my prayer. No. It's not measured by that. It's measured by your heart. There's a guy named John Hyde. They say in all of Christian history, there's not what, in modern Christian history, there has not been one person that has prayed like a man named John Hyde, praying Hyde. It says that he prayed in such a way, he was so convicted and so moved in prayer that when he would pray for something, he says, meet me by the lake to pray or something like that. And he, they would find him and he would just be on his face to the floor. He just and he says, they asked him why. And he said, I have to be as low as I could get because it's not about me. I had to humble myself before the Lord. He had to bow his heart. He had to bow his whole body. Just, just getting low. Spending time. And it says that when, even before he would, they said, let's pray for something. And when he would lead a prayer meeting, he just would be, he said he wouldn't speak for like 15, 20 minutes. He just wouldn't talk because he's just getting ready. Because he wants God to be there. And when he knew the Lord had shown up, he began to pray. The heaviness of prayer. No, God, this isn't just some quick arrow prayers. 
and those are important too. Do not get me wrong. I do not want to dog on those. They're not pray. These it's called intercession. It's intercessory prayer where you're you find yourself bent over and saying, God, it's just me and you, and I'm pouring my heart out. I will not leave until I get an answer. It's knocking like the woman in that parable and Jesus said, that's knocking until the judge answers. It's pouring it out. I will not stop praying until I get an answer from you, O oh God. I, it's not the sweet hour of prayer. It's the sweetness of prayer. It's the, you can't put a time on it. It's revival praying. And it's not bombasticness. It's not loudness. It's not exaggeratingness. It's just, Lord, I'm going to pour it all out to you in prayer. I'll tell you, I'm convicted. I want to do that more. And he's saying, hey, he finds himself on his knees. And he stands up. In verse 55, he stood and blessed all the assemblies of Israel with a loud voice. Oh, there he has a loud voice. No, he's not talking to God. He's talking to the people. He has to shout out. He's projecting. And he says, Blessed be the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel according to all that he promised. I love this verse. Guys, listen up. There has not failed one word of all his good promise. There has not failed one word of all his good promise. Do you believe that? We, we can say it, but do you believe it? That God, the whole of God's word is literally, it will not fail. God's word is faithful. He is faithful. His word is faithful. Do you believe God's word? Because it makes some statements. It says some stuff. Do you believe it? Believe it. It will not fail. Signs and wonders will pass away, but God's word never will. Are you... That, that's why it's so scary in the American church today, the level of a biblical anemia, a weakness in the biblical world, where, 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 where they don't teach the word, where they don't read the word. And when they do read the word, it's, not, it's, it's a translation that's so off, it's, just, it's, it's, it's a fortune cookie. It's, it's totally off. Guys, read the Bible. And when you read the word, you read it and you go, this is for me. And get this, every passage is for you. And therefore claim it. And if God said it, he'll do it. Might not be in your time, but he'll do it. He's faithful. Solomon says it best. Not, there has not failed one word of all his good promise. God's word will never fail you. Period. Everything, everybody else will. Look around. Look around to your room. Look, if you're sitting next to your husband, your loved ones, your friends, your family, look around. Look, even look at your pastor. Everybody is in your, in your eyeball sight right now will fail you or has the potential to fail you. Or not my sweet, darling spouse. Oh, yeah. <laughs> not my child. Not my grandkid. Not my friends. Oh, yeah. We all will. Not my pastor. Oh, we'll fail you some way. But Jesus and his word will never fail us. Thank you, Lord. Therefore, let's read it. Let's dig into it. Let's devour it. So there has not failed one word of all his good promise, which he promised through his servant Moses. May the Lord our God be with us as he was with our fathers. May he not leave us nor forsake us. Sounds familiar? That he may incline our hearts to himself. Bend our hearts to him. He wants a yielded heart to himself. To walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments which he commanded to our fathers. That he made, and made these words of mine, Solomon says, which I have made supplication, this prayer of mine, before the Lord, be near 
the Lord our God day and night, like incense, that he may maintain the cause of his servants and cause of his people, Israel, as each day may require, that all the people of the earth may know that the Lord is God and there's no other. Let your heart, therefore, be loyal, people. Let your heart be loyal to the Lord our God, to walk in his statutes and keep his commandments as at this day. Whew. Powerful. Then the king and all of Israel, we know that during this time that God lights the altar on fire. Now that's a fiery message. That's a fiery prayer life right there. He just lights the altar on fire. Then the king and all of Israel with him offered sacrifices before the Lord. And Solomon offered a sacrifice of peace offerings, which he offered to the Lord 22,000 bulls, 122,000 sheep. So the king and all the children of Israel dedicated the house of the Lord. On the same day, the king consecrated the middle court that was in front of the house of the Lord. For there he offered burnt offerings and grain offerings and the fat and the peace offerings because the, because the bronze altar, which was ginormous, was not big enough. It was too small to receive the burnt offering. So he just took the whole outer court. He dedicated the whole outer court to the Lord and he had multiple altars going on at the same time. He, he, that's the style of Solomon. Solomon's style. Just, it, we got, it's just too much. Verse 65, at, at, the same time, at that time Solomon held a feast of all of Israel. With him a great assembly of the, uh, from the entrance of Hamath, of the brook of Egypt, before the Lord our God, seven days and seven more days, 14 days in all. And on the eighth day he sent the people away. And they blessed the king and went to their tents, joyful and glad of heart for all the good that the Lord had done for his servant David and for Israel, his people. Wow. That is a dedication. Now, before we stop, one last thing. The temple, according to John chapter 2, verse 19, the temple has three parts. The Holy of Holies, the Holy Place, and the Outer Court. Three spots. The temple has three, sp three parts. So, too, we see this in John chapter 2, verse 19. Jesus is cleansing the temple his first time around. And he says, he's cleaning it out. And he says, destroy this temple and it shall be rebuilt in three days. And he was speaking of his own body. The temple is the person of Jesus Christ. Also, though, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, he's dealing with the perverted, jacked up church of Corinth. And they're doing all this wild crud. And he says, what are you doing, guys? And what does Paul say? You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And then in Ephesians chapter 2, and also in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, he says that the church as a whole is the temple of God. So the temple is three things. It's Jesus, it's our bodies, and it's the church as a whole. Those three places, Jesus our bodies, and the church. Now, if we go back to those seven things, which we won't do in detail, but if we go back to those seven things, how do we solve problems with people? Number one, it's in the person of Jesus Christ. He's our temple. We go to Jesus. He solves the problems. It's in the body of Christ, the love that we have at the body of Christ. The problems will be solved with each other in the body of Christ. It's in that intimate knowledge where the Holy Spirit dwells in us as the temple. It's in that intimacy with God. Same thing with number two. If we're defeated, if we're bummed out, how can the nation, how can the nation come to know the Lord? It's by returning to Jesus Christ. How can the nation return? It's by going to church. Guys, dry times, number three. How, how do we fix dry times? It's the person of Jesus Christ. It's going to church. It's being intimate with the Lord, the holy of holies. How can number four, how do you deal with bothering some times? When things bug you, locusts, pestilences, Jesus Christ, going to church, being intimate with the Lord. How about number five? How can, you, how can we reach the world? How, how can we, what can, how we can fix the world? Bring them to church, the person of Jesus, praying for them in the Holy of Holies. Guess what? Bringing them here, bringing people. When was the last time you brought somebody that doesn't know the Lord to church? Do it. Some of you guys are really good at it. Number six, when you go and do spiritual war, spiritual warfare, going out, 
taking on the, 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 the gates of hell. How do we do that? The person of Jesus. At church, in prayer. That intimacy with God. And maybe there are those who've been caught up and become a prodigal, taken captive by the crud of this world. What's, how can this be solved? The person of Jesus and the body of Christ and the intimacy with Jesus in their heart. Be temple people. Be the temple. Be temple people. Go to church. Be intimate with the Lord. Hang out with Jesus. That's where it's at. All right? Dear God, we just thank you for your word. Thank you for the endurance of this body of believers tonight. As we took a long chapter, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your endurance of the scriptures. We love you, Lord. We ask that we would be your people, that we would be temple people. Remind us these things in our heart and let our hearts be inclined to you. Thank you, Lord, that there's not one bit of your word that fails because you never fail. Great is your faithfulness, almighty God. How great are you. We love you, Lord. We praise your name. And Lord, there's any person here that just needs you. Let them go to your word. Let them go to you. Do a work in their hearts, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Remember that song? Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand has provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Amen. God bless you guys.